Okay, so, uh, well, thanks for the introduction and, and thanks for inviting us here uh, from Princeton and Chicago. It's really, really wonderful to be in Vienna. Um, and, you know, this is, this is work done. Uh, oh, I will, yeah. <laughs> this is work done with Gautam Sadashandran, who's here in the audience. Uh, and I want to advertise his talk on, on Wednesday at this time, I believe, um, which will take a, a somewhat unexpected turn, take applying ideas developed that, that you'll see here in a, a new context and uh, see how they behave in the presence of a black hole. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is also done with Bob Wald. And uh, uh, you can read more about this in this paper here. Uh, let's see if this works. Good. So Dyson uh, had some, I could say, uh, very provocative beliefs about quantum gravity or attitudes about quantum gravity. Um, very grounded in experiment. Uh, you know, for him, the question of quantum gravity was connected to the empirical existence of the graviton. And you know, in 2000, he, I mean, he, he famously, um, because he saw this connection between the graviton and the uh, necessity of quantum gravity, uh, he connected the question of whether a graviton was detectable in principle uh, to whether quantum gravity was necessary. Uh, so in 2000, he put it pretty, you know, sharply said, uh, you know, let's leave gravitation theory as part of the classical world don't try to drag it into quantum mechanics. And he then, uh, in this very nice uh, talk and written, <coughs> written up as a paper in 2012, uh, analyzed whether a graviton is even in principle detectable and argued it might not be. <laughs> um, on the other, so you could say, well, do we even need quantum gravity at all uh, if it's p p potentially the graviton is not detectable? Um, well, Feynman might have responded to Dyson that you need quantum gravity just on conceptual grounds. Uh, in the Chapel Hill conference, uh, where a lot of great conversations about quantum gravity took place, uh, he basically, uh, you know, he said, it it's, seems clear to me we're in trouble if we have quantum mechanics but don't have a quantum gravity theory. Uh, suppose we have a massive object for spin going through a stern gerlach apparatus, which should sound familiar to a lot of people in this room. Uh, we then have to analyze this, uh, you know, in a quantum gravitational way, uh, and uh, you know, foreshadowing things, uh, events of the present day. Lewis Witten, who is in the in attendance, said, "Well, what prevents this thing you've just described from being a practical experiment?" Um, and you know, now we live in an era where that is not so much of a, where we actually are nearly to a point where we can answer that question of Lewis Witten. I mean, maybe not tomorrow, but there certainly are, uh, uh, well, thanks to the uh, proposals of, uh, you know, what these uh, excellent people, which, you know, summarize kind of, which is often uh, kind of abbreviated to BMV, uh, and people who are leading the experimental charge to realize the experimental proposals, but uh, put forth by BMV, like many of whom are uh, at this institution, Marcus Astermeyer, Marcus Arndt, and others. Um, we, know, we, we are entering the realm where experimental probes of quantum gravity become accessible. Um, and that raises, again, the kind of question that's t been tossed around at the level of thought experiments by people like Feynman and Dyson of if gravitationally mediated entanglement is observed in the laboratory, what will we learn about quantum gravity? Um, so first, you know, I think it's really important to stress that gravity has never been observed to mediate quantum entanglement. Uh, so that it should do so is a robust prediction of every, uh, or a, a, of most but not all proposals for unifying gravity with quantum mechanics. Um, but it's never been observed. And so gravitational entanglement experiments will settle that question, and that alone would be a revolutionary insight 
into, uh, into nature. Uh, in the absence of any interpretation, just knowing that gravity can mediate entanglement would be of, it's hard to overstate how important that would be to know. So you're going to explain to us what this means? Hmm. Well, it's just, uh, if you have two initially, two systems that are initially not entangled, uh, and you only allow them to interact via gravity, is, is that sufficient to bring them into uh, an entangled state? Ah, uh, well, so, yeah, I guess this is um, kind of, uh, maybe I could briefly uh, review what's being depicted here. So you have some, initially, some uh, matter wave in, you, know, you, you, you basically put two matter wave interferometers next to each other. And initially you have the, each of them just has a piece of matter in a definite position. Then you produce a spatial superposition on each interferometer. Uh, and then you wait for those superpositions that, to become entangled with one another. Right? So they're always interacting gravitationally, but here there's no superposed degree of freedom to become entangled. After you create the superpositions, they could, in principle, become entangled. And if they're isolated electromagnetically, the only thing around to entangle them would be gravity. And then you look and see whether they're entangled after some time. Is that all right? OK. Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay, but yeah, we should, that's uh, yeah, we can definitely talk about that more because that's that's important. Um, but uh, so, you know, the question I, I want to you know, I just want to emphasize that uh, uh, you know, that alone, discovering that alone, would be incredibly important. Um, but we're trying to say, what more can we learn from that type of experiment? Uh, and there's this really nice thought experiment originally analyzed uh, by Maria et al., uh, which has proved really useful in illuminating consistency conditions that must hold quite generically uh, in any theory in which gravity can mediate entanglement. Um, and I'm going to go through that thought experiment. So uh, for simplicity, uh, we're going to present the thought experiment in the context of QED. Um, but the analysis uh, straightforwardly carries over into linearized quantum gravity, and everything happening in here is well within the regime of validity of linearized quantum gravity. Um, and to do that, it's pretty straightforward. You would just substitute mass for charge. When I say Coulomb, you could say Newtonian, et cetera, et cetera. Is there something we need? No. Okay. So, this is the, uh, uh, the thought experiment. Um, so in the distant past, uh, an experimenter, Alice, has used a stern gerlach apparatus to make a spatial superposition of a charged particle that's either up or down. So it's spin, sorry, it has spin. And the spin is either up or down. And whether it's up or down is entangled with which position the spin is in. So that should be familiar if you know what a stern gerlach apparatus does. This is the kind of state that it would produce. Um, so this has gone, gone on. This has been produced in the distant past. Um, but at a later time, here, uh, Alice is going to use a reversing stern gerlach apparatus to recombine the branches of the wave function and look for signs of decoherence of her superposition. And she can do this, uh, for instance, by looking for coherent interference of the spin. So after she's recombined the spatial components of the superposition, she just has some then superposition of spin up or spin down in the z direction. And if she spins, uh, if she measures spin along the x direction, if she measures spin down even once, then she knows that her superposition was decohered because 
a pure mixture of spin up and spin down in the z direction is a definite state of spin x. So as a f purely formal statement, um, this is not meant to be taken too literally uh, at this point, uh, but as a purely formal statement, you can think of Alice's particle being entangled with a Coulomb field, uh, where now you know I've, I've got the kind of spin and position wave functions of Alice's particle um, and a Coulomb field sourced by it. Um, and I'm going to then introduce a second experimenter, Bob, who in a space-like separated region uh, is going to attempt to measure the superposed Coulomb field. Now note, you know, he's in the future of this stationary era of Alice's superposition, so he sees a superposed Coulomb field here, and he's going to try to measure it. So for instance, one way he could do that is he could release a particle from a trap. Its trajectory would become entangled with which path Alice's particle had taken by virtue of becoming entangled with the, super, with, with the Coulomb field super generated by Alice's superposed particle. Right, so is this, is this clear so far? So now uh, this is, if you think about it for a while, uh, paradoxical. Uh, or I should say, if Bob succeeds in his measurement, it's paradoxical. Uh, because Alice's particle is totally entangled with the field it sourced, uh, as we saw in this state here. Uh, if Bob measures the field, then Alice's particle must be decohered uh, just by complementarity. If Alice, uh, we've given Alice a protocol to tell whether her particle is decohered, which is different from, in, for instance, in the case of a bell pair. And Bob, on the other hand, is free to choose whether he wants to perform the measurement or not, which would allow him to communicate a bit of information to Alice because he could choose to measure, thus decohering Alice, or choose not to measure, thus not decohering Alice, and that would be in violation of causality because Alice would receive the message at the point of her interference experiment. So this is a paradox, right? This is clearly there's something that has to give. Um, and indeed, you know, as, uh, uh, as Marios was pointing out, uh, many people uh, around this institution figured out the solution to this paradox at the level of a, a back of the envelope, uh, really a compelling back of the envelope estimate, uh, analysis, which, uh, uh, I think, which is right. Um, and it points out that there are two quantum field properties, uh, or two properties of quantum fields that are sufficient to resolve this paradox in QED and in linearized quantum gravity. Um, and those are that radiation is quantized and that the field undergoes vacuum fluctuations. So you can, at, at a kind of a intuitive level, you can see why these might be helpful because number one, Quantized radiation imposes that Alice should emit no entangling photons. Why? Because if she were to emit entangling photons, she would decohere herself, and she wouldn't be able to receive any information uh, by virtue of Bob becoming entangled with her. Right? So in order to even have a chance of telling if Bob, uh, receiving a message from Bob, she has to avoid decohering herself. She wants to avoid emitting entangling photons. So. That, mean, that means Alice is going to have to perform her experiment gradually. She can't just rapidly bring her particle together because she's going to emit entangling photons. On the other hand, vacuum fluctuations are present all over in the electromagnetic field, and Bob's particle is going to be buffeted by those vacuum fluctuations. So that means that the position of Bob's particle is not as certain as you would, th as, as you would expect just from classical evolution uh, even if he controls the, you know, the quantum mechanical dispersion of his particle, there's a fundamental constraint that his particle can't be localized any better than it would be under the influence of vacuum fluctuations of the field. And that means he needs to wait long enough for his true trajectories to separate, evolving in the Coulomb field, uh, so that their separation is bigger than the uncertainty due to vacuum fluctuations. Uh, and uh, you know, more uh, quantitatively, you know, this means that 
This, these constraints together imply that Alice is going to need to uh, uh, perform her experiment over a time period much, much larger than the effective dipole moment uh, produced by her superposition. It's not a really a dipole, you know, it's a, in a, there's kind of an effective dipole moment scale given by the charge times the distance. So she has to do her thing very slowly. Uh, and by the protocol, in order to remain space-like separated from Bob, uh, the time over which she does the experiment still needs to be less than a light travel time from her to Bob. Um, for Bob, he needs to distinguish his separation of his particle, delta x, against the vacuum fluctuation uncertainty, which I'll call big delta x. The constraint that his vacuum fluctuation uncertainty needs to be subdominant ends up, you can show, being uh, reducing just algebraically to this relation that uh, you know, it can places a constraint on the size of the effective dipole sourcing the field that's dominant, that's controlling its trajectories, uh, and relates that to the distance, which also controls the strength of the field. These, you can see, are not consistent. Right? There's no way to satisfy all of these inequalities together. So at the level of the back of the envelope analysis, because of the vacuum fluctuations and the quantized radiation, Bob can only measure the field if Alice emits entangling radiation, right? The, the only way that some, one, the only way that Bob can measure is if this, you uh, uh, violate some of these inequalities, for instance, by having Alice perform her experiment too quickly, then it's okay for, Al, for Bob to make a measurement. Uh, but then Alice would decohere herself independently of what Bob does. Okay, so that's very nice. That's a, I, at least to me, was a very surprising resolution that even in this low energy context, vacuum fluctuations play a really crucial role in protecting causality. But it's not completely satisfactory because it's it's a not a rigorous analysis, and you can kind of think of some ways you might get around it. Uh, one would be, what if Bob had n minus one assistants all over the place? Uh, could they get a one over root n reduction in the uncertainty on the mean? of their combined measurements. Uh, it's not clear whether or not that would work because vacuum fluctuations are generically entangled across space time, uh, even across space-like separated regions. Uh, and so they're not uncorrelated. So it's not clear you would get this, well, it's clear you wouldn't get exactly this one over root n enhancement, but it's also not clear that you couldn't some, you, that, that, you know, it's not clear that the entanglement structure is exactly sufficient to protect causality either. Um, so now we're going to do a general proof that no paradox can ever arise. Um, so let's go back, look at the thought experiment again, but uh, more carefully, more generally. Um, the decoherent, and first we'll start just by analyzing what Alice is doing. So the decoherence due to Alice's radiation uh, can be, you know, exactly analyzed in the limit of infinite time, where you have a nice uh, Fox space. And Alice's decoherence at infinite time uh, uh, is given by just kind of one minus the off-diagonal element of the reduced density matrix of her, of her particle, which ends up being this. Uh, but Alice is going to measure her decoherence, observe her decoherence, not at infinite times, but at some finite time. So how can we, uh, how can we use this expression uh, to infer things about finite times? Well, it turns out it's really easy, uh, so remarkably. Um, Alice interferes her particle at this point, this event P, uh, and after that, all her particle's doing is sourcing some monopole field, which is completely irrelevant for entangling, you know, it has no which path information, and we can just subtract it off. We can subtract off the monopole field after the event P, um, but then, you just have unitary free field evolution of the electromagnetic field off this Cauchy surface sigma, you know, this time slice, passing through the recombination event P all the way out to asymptotic infinity. So because it's unitary time evolution, the Fock product is, is conserved. So the decoherence that Alice measures on sigma that is, when she actually looks for decoherence, is the same as what you would have calculated at infinity. Um, and 
after, uh, you know, let, okay, so that, that's good. We now have an analysis of Alice, but let's talk about what Bob is doing. So, um, you know, after Alice has produced her superposition, but before Bob has begun measuring, uh, Bob is just sitting in some product state, waiting to open, you could think, you know, he's waiting to open his box or whatever, but I'm, I'm gonna allow Bob to do anything now. Doesn't matter what he does. Uh, but he's just sitting there before he starts his measurement. Um, but after he, after he performs his measurement, uh, he'll become entangled with, uh, uh, with the field to some degree. And when you carry that state all the way out to time-like infinity, the radiative degrees of freedom decouple, and you're just left with at time-like infinity an entangled state between some configurations of Bob ap Bob's apparatus, which also I'm assuming he, Bob is not massless, so Bob also goes out to time-like infinity, and you just end up with some entangled state between Bob and Alice. And the, coherent, the corresponding degree of decoherence of Alice's particle uh, due to Bob alone, you know, there's a, a, a part of the, earth, of the decoherence that's attributable to Bob, will just be given by you know, one minus the orthogonality of Bob's apparatus. Uh, but Bob, uh, you know, we're assuming that after he finishes experiment, he just he just goes home. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't keep he stops measuring after some time. T Bob, and so uh, the just you know the degree of decoherence at time like infinity is the same as the degree of decoherence after T Bob when Bob finished his experiment. So the decoherence, you know, at time like infinity is equal to the decoherence at T Bob. And or I'm just going to drop the T Bob subscript. You know, it, I'm just going to say, you know, from T Bob all the way out to infinity, you've got this decoherence due to Bob, uh, and the uh, uh, the total, and that's just going to be the total decoherence associated to Bob's experiment after he's finished the experiment. So it follows there would be a paradox if Bob could make the states of his apparatus more orthogonal then Alice's field would, would have been orthogonal due to her radiation alone, right? I mean, you know, I, I don't want Alice, Alice had better not be able to tell if Bob's around. And so, uh, you know, Bob had never better not be able to decohere Alice any more than the radiation field that's produced by Alice's experiment, regardless of what Bob does. But that amounts to this inequality, this is what would this would be sufficient to produce a paradox. Like this, would, uh, uh, this would certainly allow Bob to communicate to Alice. But now let's see if that's possible. Right. So we're going to allow Bob to perform any arbitrary measurement in the shaded region, uh, subtracting off the common Coulomb field after Alice completes her measurement. Um, and uh, uh, the state on sigma 1 is just given by this expression here. Uh, now that we've subtracted off the Coulomb field, this is actually a, uh, no longer a formal expression. Uh, and uh, time evolving, so again, this is sigma 1. Notice that sigma 1 is chosen to go behind Bob's experiment and through the recombination point of Alice. So on this time slice, Bob has yet to begin his experiment, and Alice is measuring her amount of decoherence. Uh, time evolution from sigma 1 uh, on to sigma 3 gives a state on sigma 3 that looks like this. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you can, it'll give you know, a state where you have the uh, uh, Alice's matter entangled with the field produced by Alice, but now with some degree of entanglement, excuse me, with uh, Bob's apparatus, because now Bob has finished his measurement by time sigma 3. Uh, but you know, all that's happening from sigma 1 to sigma 3 is unitary time evolution. So you can just, uh, you get this equality just by the conservation of the uh, inner product. Uh, you know, uh, so you have this uh, relationship just by unitary time evolution through Bob's region from sigma 1 to sigma 3. Uh, that, uh, well, mathematically looks like this. But we can, this has a nice interpretation 
This says that the decoherence associated with Bob's measurement is bounded by the decoherence that Alice would inflict on herself due to her own radiation. Um, so this is the decoherence she would have inflicted on herself, regardless of what Bob did. And this is the decoherence due to Bob. And now we've proven that decoherence due to Alice's own radiation is always, uh, you know, no, uh, is always greater than or equal to the decoherence due to Bob's measurement. So Bob certainly can uh, never decohere Alice by an amount greater than she would have decohered herself in his absence. And I should point out that uh, although it may not have seemed like it, the vacuum fluctuations have appeared again. Uh, because the fact that, uh, you know, Alice's distinct field states here have uh, totally different expected values of the electric field. So you might think they should be orthogonal, which would mean Alice's decoherence would be one. Uh, but they're not. The only reason they're not is because of vacuum fluctuations. The vacuum fluctuations are precisely what uh, determine the amount of overlap between her states and end up uh, producing this bound um, on what Bob can do. Um, and even more generally, uh, you know, remember this equality that we proved. Uh, this actually, you can read this as saying that uh, the decoherence that Alice observes if Bob performs a measurement uh, is always precisely equal to the decoherence that's attributable uh, to her own radiation uh, before Bob even began to measure, calculated on sigma one, right? So there's absolutely no way that Bob can ever influence the degree of decoherence that Alice observes because these two things are exactly equal by unitarity. Um, and of course, you know, nothing I did here is particularly special to electromagnetism. Uh, it proceeds in uh, the same way in the case of linearized quantum gravity. And more generally, uh, you know, in any coordinate independent theory, because I, I used the freedom to choose foliations here, um, admitting an effective description in terms of evolution of data from sigma one onto sigma three, you can imagine there a, 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 sigma, a similar analysis uh, would likely go through. Uh, but certainly it goes through in the case of linearized quantum gravity and ENM, that's for sure. Uh, so we've seen that in QED and in quantum gravity, vacuum fluctuations and the entanglement structure of the vacuum fluctuations, because we had to overcome that one over root n argument, which we, uh, we just did by, by you know, by uh, an overwhelming rigor. Uh, uh, you know, the entanglement structure is sufficient and the quanti that taken together with quantized radiation plays a crucial role in protecting causality. Um, but you could also, you know, th th that's all really nice. I, that's really uh, informative, um, illuminating about questions of how causality works in quantum field theory and even in low energy quantum gravity. Uh, but are there any more generic lessons that can be learned uh, about the low energy description of quantum gravity? Um, and uh, the answer is yes. So uh, generically, a graviton, uh, regardless of what specific picture of a graviton you might have in mind, uh, generically, a graviton is a propagating degree of freedom of the quantum gravitational field. And bringing it back to the, our discussion of the BMV experiment, you know, BMV does not measure gravitons, right? I mean, BMV, uh, well, it's the matter constrained aspects of space time, which are superposed in the BMV experiment. In QED, the analogous quantity is the Coulomb field. And by analogy, we, call, we could call that the Newtonian field, uh, which satisfies the constraints of matter on the geometry of space time. Uh, BMV probes entanglement mediated by the superposed Newtonian field. Uh, so, but Nonetheless, what does our Gedanken experiment say about the relation between the Newtonian field uh, and entanglement mediated by the Newtonian field and gravitons? Uh, well, let's go back to our Cauchy surfaces. So if Bob becomes entangled with Alice by evolving off evolution off of sigma one, right? I evolve this forward and 
uh, that you know that the field states evolving through Bob's experiment and Bob's becoming entangled through evolution off of sigma one. Uh, the entanglement is entirely attributable to propagating degrees of freedom of the quantum field. Why? Because this is a after I do this, I subtract off the Coulomb field that has no which path information contributes nothing to entanglement. This is just a free field Cauchy surface. Uh, so evolution off sigma one. All entanglement Bob experiences is completely due to uh, on-shell gravitons. That is, you know, just free field propagating degrees of freedom of the quantum gravitational field. But, uh, you know, the choice of an equal time Cauchy surface is merely a coordinate choice. So on the equal time coordinate sigma two, uh, Bob's finished his measurement already. And Alice hasn't even begun to recombine. So the only thing that exists on sigma two is a superposed Newtonian field. So Bob clearly on sigma two has become entangled with the superposed Newtonian field. And there are absolutely no gravitons to be found. So you know, if either description holds, then both descriptions must hold simultaneously. I mean, I'm, I'm arguing that it, both are correct descriptions. They just differ by a coordinate choice. Uh, and let's think about that. So suppose gravitons decohere Alice. Well, the Newtonian field can't mediate entanglement for some reason. Well, then the Newtonian field differs from the graviton field only by a choice of coordinates in Bob's region. So the graviton field must not mediate entanglement either. Uh, but this is not consistent. Gravitons should be able to interact in any theory where they can be produced. Right? So I'm, I'm saying, you know, gravitons decohere Alice, but that means they can be produced, so they need to be uh, able to interact. I mean, production without interaction is uh, just a, a, you know, that's an oxymoron. But suppose instead that Newtonian entanglement decoheres Alice, but gravitons can't. Well, then Alice wouldn't be able, Alice wouldn't decohere unless Bob were present. Well, that's in like flagrant violation of causality, right? So clearly that's not possible. Uh, but taken together, these considerations show there's a direct relationship between Newtonian entanglement and the existence of on shell gravitons. Uh, our argument for such a relationship applies strictly, uh, as we've seen, uh, in the valid, I, I, you know, in the regime when the measurement of the Newtonian field is carried out within one light travel time to the source, that is, you know, Bob's in his little space-like separated patch. Um, however, that causal regime is continuously connected to, uh, just by a small, de a small, arbitrarily small deformation of Alice's protocol, to the regime of actual proposed experiments. Uh, and this yields strong support for the view that any observation of entanglement mediated by a Newtonian field provides evidence for the existence of the graviton. Uh, so, you know, it's extremely difficult to measure a graviton, uh, perhaps even impossible, as Dyson argued. Um, but quantum gravitational experiments are conceivable. Uh, as Feynman pointed out. And uh, as of recently, they're even practical. Uh, and indeed, the experimental discovery of Newtonian entanglement can be viewed as implying the existence of the graviton. Uh, so, you know, maybe someday soon, this will be uh, our updated model of nature. So, so thanks. Uh, listen to the questions on the video. Ah, good. And we need one USB port. Is there one? Yes, I, I will free one up in a moment. I just need to transfer my talk to the desktop here. One here. Oh, oh, there is. Oh, even better. Go for it. Maybe you can put your slides up. Yeah. Uh, 
Anyway, so let's hope that this thing is working. Ah, well, uh, sorry, sorry, what was the, qu what was no, the question? The idea is that maybe you have N bots and yeah. you, you get a piece of information. And then That's right. Yeah, so the idea there, uh, you know, just to make sure we're clear on what that would be, I mean, uh, of what I was claiming might be possible, although I then prove it's not possible, is that suppose you have a whole bunch of experimenters around uh, if they were able to perform uncorrelated experiments, uh, which you might think is possible because you could put them in space-like separated regions from one another, um, and if they were to perform uncorrelated measurements of the Newtonian field, they could combine their measurements and the standard deviation on the mean would be reduced by a factor of one over root n. So then that analysis would lead you to think, well, maybe if you have enough bobs around doing it measurements, they could, uh, determine which path Alice took, thus becoming entangled with her by complementarity, uh, you know, decohering her superposition. Uh, now, that, that argument is uh, not, c clearly can't be exactly right, just on its face, because vacuum fluctuations are highly entangled. Uh, so the, the noise that's, uh, you know, stopping Bob from per performing an arbitrarily precise measurement is uh, correlated to some degree with the noise that's stopping each of his assistants from performing an accurate experiment. Um, but, uh, and that's due to the entanglement structure of quantum fields uh, across even space-like separated regions. But it's not so clear just from that analysis that the entanglement structure would be just right to prevent any such enhancement or a let's say, a sufficient, not over 1 over root n, but some amount of enhancement that would nonetheless be good enough to restore the paradox. Um, clearly, it is sufficient bec by this argument, right? So, so what the argument is showing is that, uh, you know, although it's somewhat uh, counterintuitive, even across space-like separated regions, the entanglement structure of the quantum field is sufficient. Uh, it must be sufficient to prevent a paradox from arising. Uh, I don't know if that. What if I can make a term of scale? Like, like, I mix a little bit, not only that much. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know how to do it, but uh, so that I decrease uh, an entanglement. Ah, uh, uh, well. I mean, the argument doesn't care what B. I, I guess, you know, the original argument doesn't care how many parties constitute what you have as a B cap. Mm -hmm. I guess this. That's right. The, Yes, that's right. Um, but the so that's right. But even if you analyze uh, uh, a thermal state, you can look at every uh, you know every component of the thermal state, kind of every component of the incoherent mixture, and each one of those will have this degree of vacuum entanglement. So there can't be you know, any component of the mixture in which there's a paradox. So there can't be a paradox. Hmm? Yes, I have a couple of questions. I guess, and uh, one comment. So I think uh, Dyson's argument is obviously wrong. So I mean, he may, may be right in the general sense that it's impossible, but specifically his argument is obviously wrong. Um, so I think question to this, um, Uh, uh, yes. So, she, yeah. so, so, so nobody around you will not always measure like one thing, but there will be fluctuations. Yes, in that's right, that's right. And that's basically how the vacuum fluctuations come into the measurement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the field is fluctuating if you, even if Alice were to repeat her measurement multiple times. Uh, only, uh, 
Well, if she repeated her measurement, she'd see some variation. Yeah. That's due in, you know, assuming she controlled everything else, like we, you know, this is an idealized experiment, there would always be an irreducible amount of variation due to vacuum fluctuations. Uh, well, the, so the, if you look at the, the whole measurement, every measurement also without quantum field theory has some uh, imprecision basically between spinners and back and whatnot. Mm. So it's not obvious to me that you really need the vacuum fluctuations. I mean, it sounds totally fine that with the vacuum fluctuations, the paradox goes away. But I'm just saying it's not obvious to me that you really need it. Well, you would need uh, not only, yeah, you would need something very, very much like vacuum fluctuations. Uh, because it would need to be uh, uh, entangled across space-like separated regions, whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, you, you, people have tried to analyze this kind of situation and say, well, how would we be able to tell, but, you know, stochastic noise from vacuum fluctuations? But, you know, the kind of one over root n argument does say that uh, if you didn't have a very particular kind of entanglement structure between experiments per potentially performed in space-like separated regions out of causal contact, uh, then you would get a one over root n improvement by combining them. So, I mean, it, there, you know, I, I, we do this in, you know, the, the, the complete rigor of the analysis only really applies when you have a specific model in mind, you know, so then we, we apply it in linearized quantum gravity and QED, but uh, more generally, you know, any, thing that you try to cook up that doesn't have vacuum fluctuations, well, whatever fluctuations there are would need to have this kind of entanglement structure that is uh, eerily like vacuum fluctuations. So you wouldn't get the inequality? So it must be some interest Sorry, which inequality are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you, so I'm saying the 1 over square root of n is what you would get if the, uh, fluc the noise of Bob's experiment were completely uncorrelated. And then you could violate this inequality. And then you could produce a paradox. Um, so you need, but Bob, the Bob and his assistants could be space-like separated from one another. So then, you know, you really need a pe peculiar kind of uh, correlation uh, you know, not like uh, Brownian motion or anything like that, um, that in order to avoid a paradox, and it, vacuum fluctuations are sufficient, and it's, uh, you know, I, I, would, I, I would suggest probably the closer, the more and more you try to avoid the paradox, the closer and closer to vacuum fluctuations you get in describing the correlations that need to be present. That's right. Well, I mean, any kind of correlation between, I mean, well, in the QED case, you can isolate Bob before he opens his trap, right? So. Um, it's not clear that when they're in, tra like if you isolate, if in the electromagnetic case, if you shield each Bob's probe, uh, it's not clear that there would be any correlation before you open the trap. And the correlation then would propagate within the light cone after you open the trap. And then you open the shield, do you measure again? Uh, I'm not sure I understood okay. that. This, this is my basic argument.
what you're saying. And, and, uh, and indeed, I mean, you have just this uh, banality conditions. They don't, I mean, all this story about fluctuations, understanding it, but this is so general. Mm. And, it, it, uh, and that's why it's beautiful. <laughs> but, but maybe just talking about quantum mechanics before quantum field is that you should trap the particles. So yeah. on one hand, you want to be very localized. Yeah. Because to distinguish the initial localization, depending on whether the other uh, mass or whatever charge is closer or, or further away, then yeah. you have uncertainty in momentum. Now, when you open the trap, the kick that you will get from the difference of the source of, of the forces of the source being closer or further away must be larger than uncertainty in momentum. So it's not obvious that even in the quantum mechanics, without quantum uh, fluctuations, you have an immediate distinguishability. Yeah, that, no, and, and I would agree. It certainly is not an immediate distinguishability. Uh, I guess the problem is that no matter how little the distinguishability is, uh, if you have enough bobs in, out of causal contact with one another, then you can reduce the uncertainty on the mean by root, by root n. So, yeah, I agree that even quantum mechanically, you have to evolve for some amount, finite amount of time. But, uh, you know, if, if uh, but in quantum mechanics... Yes, because, because of quantum, I agree, because of the classical, the, because of the quantum mechanical uncertainty just on the particle without the field, I completely agree. Uh, but uh, then you would get this one over root n paradox. Not in space-like separated regions. Well, so if Bob is enclosing Alice spatially, um, it's not clear uh, why he wouldn't, it's not clear that, that, that he would be obeying the protocols anymore. Uh, I mean, he would be, he'd be now also to the future of Alice, uh, unless he kind of disassembled his thing really fast. But, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think that would be, there would be some kind of optimal thing Bob could do if he, but, but I'm trying to keep Bob in the space-like separated region. I mean, and yeah, if he enclosed Alice's experiment with a sphere, uh, you know, presumably then, then he's just measuring her radiation and there isn't really a, a paradox so much. I don't know if I answered your question though. Uh, well, because if B1 were orthogonal to B2, well, then really, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, physically, why? Yeah, yeah, uh, I mean, that's just saying that, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, Bob could, uh, I mean, it's basically just saying that Bob is never going to get any more orthogonal than the thing he's trying to measure allows him to get orthogonal. Uh, you know, he, he, he's trying to measure the field. The field is going to buffet his, his apparatus around, you know, uh, in order for him to become even more strongly entangled than that, uh, well, he would need more information about the field than the field is giving him locally. Um, I mean, so naively, I would have thought that, well, these two arms, like two out of the state of the field, so you got two electrons come here and the other there, then psi one is the Higgs Coulomb switch on this one, psi two is the Higgs Coulomb switch on this one. You can complete control of this color product, and you're saying, no, actually, the Higgs can equal is some uh, large extent in our control, so that some equality is very bad that this happens. 
Well, I, mean, I guess I'm here, Bob. I'm modeling Bob as something that's responding to the field. I mean, uh, I mean, he can certainly he could make him uh, like B1 and B2 are the parts of his apparat are the parts of his wave function that are entangled with the uh, the the radiation or entangled with the Coulomb field of Alice. So, I mean, uh, certainly Bob could in some other basis make components of his wave function highly orthogonal, but then it wouldn't be entangled in, to any degree with Alice's experiment. So. Ah, yeah, th that's a good point. So yes, you could tune it so that, yeah, what we're showing is Bob could, if in any situation where Bob could become orthogonal, Alice would also be co totally decohered by radiation. That's what this equality is showing. Yeah, because so Bob hasn't even started here. Yeah, 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 that's right. So if, if, if Alice wanted to decohere less, she'd need to do her experiment slowly, very gradually. That would expand this diamond and push Bob's region farther and farther away. You know, or if he wanted to stay close, he'd get less and less time. <laughs> right. On the other hand, if Bob wants more and more time, or if he wants to get closer and closer, either one, it shrinks this diamond, and Alice is now forced to emit more and more radiation. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting, that's certainly one of the things that surprised me about this when I first read the, you know, Balenci et al. paper as well. Um, I guess the, the, the point is that energy scaling arguments uh, uh, don't guarantee, you know, when it comes to questions of the causal consistency of the theory, uh, energy scaling arguments are a good heuristic, but they're not always sufficient to tell you which effects are going to be relevant. Um, you know, there's no guarantee, uh, you know, there's, yeah, well, I guess by construction, 
uh, quantum mechanics coupled to classical fields admits paradoxes of causality. And I agree that usually you would, ha you would assume that at low energies there's absolutely nothing, uh, no need to use quantum field theory, but um, uh, you know, that's more of a rule of thumb than a, than a theorem. And in this case, uh, you do need it. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So I wouldn't say it's low energy because the thing kind of measuring like a classical sensor has infinite masses. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. I wouldn't say even low or high energy. This is a matter of principle. Every yes. theory has to satisfy this. Yes. With some restrictions and uh, record in the independence. Yes. Yes. And I wonder if even whether one can learn something about the of measurement of certain observables, even going beyond uh, this quantum field picture. Like, like whatever candidate for quantum gravity is, and you say, I can, uh, I, I have something like a, on one side, Coulomb uh, field, and then I measure on both sides, whatever it is. Like, I feel like this is so strong argument. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. So you're saying if I have a superposition of Coulomb fields that's coherent, yes. I bring a charge by, it'll become entangled. But if I have a mixture of Coulomb exactly. fields, it won't be so entangled. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. No, I think we'd probably like to think more about that situation because that's really interesting. agree as the at the level of a practical experiment you know you would need to avoid the vacuum fluctuations from electromagnetism you'd need a, a, a test body with zero charge exactly zero charge which is no, no. I'm not sure why you, you, yeah, I mean, couldn't you produce a superposition of a mass by, for instance, uh, if I send a coherent state of gravitons or just a coherent beam of gravitational radiation at something? I'm not saying, now, again, we're... But I'm saying I don't think you need any electromagnetic component at all to run the linearized quantum gravity situation. Yeah. No, it, Yes, using you, if you send a coherent beam of gravitons, oh, yeah, right? Okay, and then apart from that, you need some electromagnetic. That, that was my point. How? Um, Why? Um, yeah, I mean, because the uh, the amplitude to absorb the gravitons will not be one, right? So, yeah. if you send a coherent beam of gravitons at a source, there'll be some some chance that you kick it, some chance you won't. But then it's in a superposition of positions. Yeah. Well, but a, a coherent beam of gravitons is also known as a gravitational wave. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure.
That's right. Yeah. No. So. So. Well. The. I think that's. We should talk more about that. But the basic argument is that any. You know. We. We don't do experiments in isolation where we. You know. We. We just. Uh, only take knowledge of the. You know. If we did those experiments in isolation, we could just say, well. Uh, all we can ever, we, we can just plug in a Newtonian potential and attach it to each of the sources. And that's a sufficient explanation for, uh, or, or for each, each branch of the wave function, I should say. And that's a sufficient model to explain the, precisely what's going on in the BMV experiment. But we have lots of other experiments, right? We need, we need, a, uh, we need a consistent, we need to interpret an experiment in such a way that it's consistent with relativistic causality. Uh, I would claim that you know just attaching Newton fields to things is not sufficient, is not compatible with relativistic causality, um, and in particular, you know any kind of interpretation of the experiment uh, should be able to consistently describe, uh, be able to consistently describe what happens uh, if, in principle, you could perform the experiment under the protocols of the thought experiment. Um, you know, that's, so, you know, it's like when we claim that we've discovered the Higgs boson, uh, you know, you have to assume a lot about the standard model <laughs> to claim that because we don't actually absorb Higgs bosons at, in, in, in the accelerator, like in the calorimeter. But nonetheless, you know, you take the sum total of what we know about the standard model and then you can extrapolate and say they're Higgs boson. That's the kind of argument that we're giving here. Absolutely. That's true. Uh, it will be, uh, yeah, no, that's exactly, I, I completely agree with that. Um, uh, I think where, you know, there is still a, just, you know, there still is a step of extrapolation because it would be in the causally, causally disconnected regime in order for the exact arguments here to apply. But that's continuously connected to the regime in which BMV actually takes place, right? And, uh, and we can talk more about what, uh, uh, you know, how, st how strong that argument is, but I believe it's, you know, well, uh, exactly as strong as we've said here. Uh, you know. <laughs> Yes. But if you would say only you know Newtonian entanglement, no gravitons. Mm -hmm. If Alice did her experiment a bit earlier, but uh, you know we're saying you have to say you have to say it's correct, or you have to allow for gravitons to develop in her experiment at space-like separated regions. I mean, like look, you know, if I yes. then move this diamond. Up and yeah, that's that's what I mean. So that's a much better way of saying what I what I mean by it's continuously connected under a arbitrarily small deformation of Alice's protocol. Is that Alice can just oh I changed my mind I'm going to wait a little longer, now it's BMV. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, definitely.